my son finally asked me a stark question this week. He said, Dad, and I adopted, and tell me the truth. And he, I'm sure he's asked me that before, and I can only imagine it's come from watching television shows and or some kind of media he's consumed, where quite often that's used as an insult of, oh, well, you're adopted, so you're not a, a legitimate son or child. And my answer was, well, no, of course you're not. And he kind of could trace back earlier memories and see that I was telling the truth that he remembers me from very early on. Um, it still doesn't prove it, because he can't remember you know, the very first few years. But what I also said to him was, because I'd been studying this this week, and I thought that was such an interesting question for him to ask me when I'd been studying this this week, because being mindful of some of the points I was trying, going to try to make today, um, I, th I thought I would use it as a teaching moment. And I said, well, do you know, even if you were adopted, wouldn't actually make a difference. I don't think um, I would love you any less or you'd be any less my child. Because we maybe have lost something of, of the power of what adoption meant in the ancient world. Um, it was much more common in the Greco-Roman period, which is why for Paul and his hearers and his readers, it's a much more vivid illustration of what God has done for his people. And as he's fighting to confirm and secure their identity and who they are as the true people of God, um, then this whole idea of adoption is actually very helpful to him. I've called today sons and slaves because in the world Paul's writing into those were the sort of two categories and there was a, a huge chasm, a world of difference between them, whether you were, a, if you like, a, a family member, and that could be through birth or adoption, or, or a slave, and one meant you would inherit all the goodness and promises of your family, and one meant that you wouldn't. And the world that he's in, I thought actually, it's probably most helpful if we read, uh, reread a few verses of from what Elizabeth shared with us, because the background is that he's battling with ideas that are common in the ancient world about the, if you like, the elemental forces. And I thought it would probably be useful to explain in terms of the background a little bit of exactly what that meant in Paul's world. In the beginning of chapter four, as we read, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. And then, later in chapter four, so also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the time set had fully come, God sent a son, born of a woman and born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now, can you see that Paul there is linking this uh, idea of being in some sort of guardianship under the law, but also kind of being enslaved to elemental forces? So, none of what I don't think any of what Paul is saying makes sense unless you try and get a handle on what he means by elemental forces, because it's, it's a strange phrase. It's not one that I use much in conversation, and I doubt you do either. Um, so he's in a world where the best minds of the day, the sort of the university professors, um, have said that reality consists of a few elements. Um, and some of you will probably know this because it, uh, well, Earth, Wind and Fire, the popular band, that was basically what people thought everything was made up of. I'm pretty sure that's where they got their name from. Uh, earth, air, uh, fire, and water were the elements that were thought to make up all reality. So today, a bit like you and I would say, reality is made up of, well, probably atoms at the very basic level. That's what they thought things were made of then. So fine, Paul's using the world that is common to them. And he's saying that's the, the forces of this world, but also, it was thought in terms of medicine at the time that that's what made up people's bodies, a kind of combination of those things. And so if you wanted to um, make people well, it, it was some sort of um, interplay between those elements that was going off, uh, uh, kind of off the, the, the normal harmony and balance, which meant it needed some sort of cure to be brought in. And so what he's doing is linking all of that to their understanding of their Old Testament. Well, how is that? Because one of the curses on the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, as we've been thinking about, was that if you don't follow God's ways and you wander off the path, then you're going to be left to just the idols of this world. 
Now, what are idols made of? Well, what's the polemic that you hear again and again in the Old Testament about the futility of idols? It's that they're made of wood and stone and they're dumb and they are just earthly and made of earthly materials and they have no spirit or breath or nothing animate in them that's able to make them do anything. So Paul's saying, you were basically you are left, if you're just going to follow the law that was given in the Old Testament and you're not going to actually uh, walk in the freedom and the promise of what Jesus has come to do, you're no different to the pagans around you who just believe in the elements of this world and that, that that's all that there is. And you're also kind of left without the blessing that was promised in the Old Testament. You're um, left with just the, the kind of, you're left to the idols that it says the people would end up worshiping as a curse because that's all you have because the law isn't actually able to completely set you free. It's able to keep things at bay, um, a bit like if you're sick, then you can, if you've got a raging fever and a virus, you can take some paracetamol and it'll take your temperature down and it'll keep things regulated but if you're really sick with a virus, you, well, it either needs to run its course or hopefully you could get some good antivirals. He's saying it's not able to take you all the way. There's a kind of inherent weakness to if all you have is the cycle of things in this world. And that's what he's, take, he's taking their understanding of that as the background and introducing th- into that, he's saying, this is how the God of Abraham, this is how his son, Jesus Christ, this is how the spirit that he came to give you, how they work in order to release you from that sort of cycle. I want to think about that this morning because in mostly just in the first few verses of chapter four, Paul beautifully demonstrates how the the Trinitarian God, the three persons in the Godhead all work together to give people this release and this sense of life and vitality that isn't possible in any other way. So I wanna think about, particularly in terms of adoption, how uh, Christ paves the way for us to be adopted as sons and daughters, and then how God the Father receives us as sons and daughters, and finally, how the Spirit confirms us as sons and daughters. How does Christ Jesus pave the way and essentially make us sons and daughters of God? God sent his son, born of a woman, verse four, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. A bit like I explained in the introduction, there are a couple of problems that stop people experiencing the full life of God. Um, One of them is the alienation that they experience from God. Now that's an old problem because that goes back all the way to the garden. Um, Because the real curse of of what happens with the the fall is that people experience this break from knowing that they're close and connected to God which is what they were made for. And that's not being able to, Paul's bringing it and putting it in their face and saying, that's not any better today. Um, The society you're in, the society Israel has always existed in, they've really struggled with this maintaining um, proximity and connection to God. That's the first problem. And secondly, the other problem is that they're stuck in this cycle of pollution, if you like, or, or corruption. They are unable to stop doing the things that separate them and cause that gap between them and God and disturb and disquiet their souls and also lead to a further inhumanity to those around them uh, that bring them into tribes and factions that fight against one another. There, there's all of those problems. And the way that Jesus addresses them is by going into and through those exact problems and conditions. Let me explain that to you, and and hopefully from the text, I hope this isn't just my own idea. God sent a son born of a woman and born under the law to redeem those under the law. You see, somebody who offers the solution at 30,000 feet distance doesn't actually feel perhaps like for us, it doesn't feel like they perhaps know that much. Um, 
a solution that's given to us by someone who has walked in our shoes is almost inherently more precious because we know they've experienced it and we know that they've found the way out of it. Really, really silly story, but it does illustrate it nicely, is um, the guy who falls into the hole and a uh, rabbi goes by and he says, oh, I'm sorry you've fallen into the hole, I've, I'll pray for you. And then a minister goes by, he's not the hero of the story, and he goes by and he, and he says, oh, I'll, I'll mention you in our prayers in church the next week. And a priest comes by and he jumps down into the hole with him. And the guy says, and what are you doing? Now we're both down here and stuck. And he says, no, 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 no. I've been down here before and I know the way out. You see, that is the kind of picture of salvation that you have in Jesus. And that's why he's legitimately qualified to make us sons and daughters of God. Because he was born of a woman, the same way you and I are, coming into that experience of being one of us, of being born into the same conditions, of being faced with the same constant temptation and entrapment to continue the cycle of evil and abuse in life, of being born into the very genealogy of the human beings who um, set this whole thing off course in the first place. He does all of that, and then when you think about the cycle of darkness and pollution, and we thought about this a couple of weeks ago, so I won't spend much time on it, but he goes right into the very heart of that darkness on the cross at Calvary. He goes to the deepest point at which human beings could possibly express the darkness of, and pollution in their hearts, and he bears it and experiences it so that he can deal with it and put it away. And then he's able to give us this wonderful gift. And he does all of that because Paul is so deliberate in the way he characterizes it. God sent his son. He does all of that as the divine son. He is the rightful heir of all God's treasure and promises. He has been in intimate relationship with God the Father from all eternity. And so what he does is, rather than maintaining that as it is and having uh, no material change to it, he decides to experience the darkness of the curses in the Old Testament in and on himself that he might give us what he has, sonship daughtership, connection to the Father himself. And so Jesus is uniquely and beautifully qualified to give us that, but it's all because of his action and agency that we're able to, be, that we're able to come into this connection where we're crying with uh, truth and sincerity to God as our Father. Jesus paves the way and indeed makes us sons and daughters because of his work. And then secondly, the father, if you like, takes us and receives us on, on that basis because of what Jesus does is the father's initiative, God sent his son. But then also he tells this um, extended story about Hagar and Sarah and Ishmael and Isaac in the Old Testament. And that's the best way to understand that is an extended illustration uh, of what he's trying to get across to them about the, how absolutely centrally they are, the children of promise that were always promised to Abraham. You, in verse 28, brothers and sisters like Isaac are children of the promise. He contrasts, um, Ishmael was born sort of by Abraham's own machinations, the best human way, or uh, the using the elemental forces of this world, the way he thought he could get a son. And God said, no, 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 you're going to have a son purely by a miracle and by the promise of my spirit. I've got my own way of doing things and a better way of doing things. And that's the contrast. And he's trying to get to them the same way God planned and also accepted Isaac as, as that legitimate heir. So God accepts you. It doesn't matter whether you were born a Jew or not. It doesn't matter whether you keep um, the temple feasts and festivals or the special high and holy days. None of that is what qualifies you as a legitimate aid of God. It's purely God's accepting you based on the fact that you, 
you believed that Jesus did that for you. You found your identity in this amazing work that he did to adopt people and bring them into that experience. And do you know what I think the, the, the proof and the test of that is? Uh, Paul elsewhere in the New Testament says, see if you want to have a tally or a chart of credentials, I'm always going to win. Paul says that he was a Pharisee, which were the most extreme interpreters of the law at the time. Um, he was so zealous, he persecuted Christians and got them thrown in jail. He followed and observed all the laws perfectly. He did all of that, and his claim is he still needed to find his identity in this adoption, to be brought into the family through Jesus, by God's Spirit. If, and if he needed that, then my goodness, everyone else, if that's legitimate for him, he's saying that is legitimate for you too. Don't try and crawl in some other way, accept the miraculous nature by which God is doing it, but still the, the reality of what he's doing because he's asking them to cry out, Abba, Father, you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. What he's trying to do with their imagination is say, the question that's been asked since Genesis 15, let's go to Genesis 15, is now being answered. Because this is the power of the language that he uses for them being an heir. This is Abraham wondering if God is, in, is indeed going to do this miracle. Abraham said, you've given me no children, so a servant in my house will have to be my heir. And the Lord said, this will not be your heir, but a son who's your own flesh and blood. And he took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars, if you can count them. And said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. The power of what Paul's getting across to them and I was saying, see that night that Abraham looked up to the stars and he was promised many, many, many children. He said that Abraham believed that on the basis of faith. And you now are getting to take part in being the answer to that question. How? Not by your genetics, not by your law observance, not by your credentials, but by faith. It's staggeringly simple, and yet it is so profound. And so often in Christianity, we can uh, trip over the staggeringly simple because we're looking for a more profound way or a way that uh, somehow engenders more of our own effort so that we can feel perhaps that we had a part in it. And he's saying it was by faith that he did that. And it is by faith that you are those children that he saw from far off. You are looped and folded into the promises of God. You have that inheritance. God considers you a full child adopted into his family. And so, as I tried to get across to Finley, when there's this power behind the idea of adoption and someone taking someone into their family who perhaps had no legitimate claim to it, but now they do, and now nobody is able to contest their legitimacy of their claim. It's actually a, a beautiful thing. Um, I saw there was there's a great program on the BBC just now about Northern Ireland um, in the Troubles. And uh, there's, it's late 70s and, and things are really starting to kick off and, and bombings going off all the time in Belfast. <coughs> and there was this uh, one rather eccentric, eccentric gentleman who uh, didn't know what he could do in order to try and bring people together because he was fed up of, of the bloodshed and, and the war. And he was really into music and of course late 70s, so the punk scene is really taking off. And what he decides to do is open the Good Vibrations record shop. And that place was a haven and a community. And in his own words, it was an oasis of calm in a sea of madness because it doesn't matter in there if you were Catholic or Protestant or neither. You came there to uh, enjoy browsing records, to meet other people who loved music. He was hilarious and he, he was almost like a, a father figure to a lot of the young punks and people who were buying records and stuff. You and I live in a really turbulent world that still has this cycle of pollution and hatred, but the church should be a beautiful place 
where what qualifies us all to come in is go, actually, I'm adopted by God the Father. And, and he has loved me through Jesus Christ. And I, I believed that Jesus has done that in, for me and brought me in. And that's my qualification to be in here. But that humbles me because that means that I'm actually looking for other people to come in here and find this oasis that I found of God's love. And it doesn't matter where they've come from because I want this place to be an oasis. I want other people to find that because there's nothing better than knowing that God, the creator of all, is, is your father. And so Jesus, as the Messiah, paves the way for that. And then God accepts all of us as his children. And finally, the Spirit confirms that for us. You notice how through all of this, Paul weaves the centrality of um, the, the Spirit of God working. <clears throat> God sent the Spirit of his Son, it's just another way of saying the Holy Spirit, into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, so that you're not a slave, but a son. Now, all this might sound a bit I think up to that point, you can follow it practically, and it's quite logical how God, through the work of Jesus on the cross and the adoption, and, and perhaps this is the most mystical part, and perhaps for me, the hardest part to explain, but it's, it's nonetheless real, and I think it's nonetheless a wonderful part of the promise of what God's given us. You see, um, God doesn't just ask us to believe and hope in what Jesus has done for us, and then kind of accept logically and cognitively that we're adopted of sons and daughters. He gives us something to confirm and guarantee that. The, the point of the, if you like, the New Testament church is that they're in a new era where God sends his own spirit to powerfully work in and through his people. And you know, for his orig original readers reading this, they would have known God's spirit as the way that it's, the ways that it showed up in the Old Testament. You know, perhaps most uh, strikingly as the pillar of cloud and fire that led the people of Israel through the wilderness um, and, and was God's, a uh, measure of God's good guidance. And it won't be lost on them that the power of what is being claimed now is that that spirit, that exact same spirit has now been sent to come and make its home and live inside of you. And when you're a bit lost and you're wondering about all of this and how it could possibly be true, that spirit will remind you that you belong to God and confirm that. We'll think about this in later weeks, but that spirit will then do things in your life. It'll produce a newness in your life. It'll make you want to uh, do new things like show love and mercy and goodness to people who maybe otherwise wouldn't have experienced that. Because it is the very Spirit of God working inside you. Just as the um, temple in the Old Testament was meant to be a, a receptacle and a holder for the Spirit and the activity of God, the, if you like, the scandalous nature of what Paul is saying is now um, you are that receptacle. You are the holder of God's very spirit and you get to carry that into the world and that spirit will keep reminding you that you are a full son and daughter of God and then also all the beautiful responsibilities that come with that to show people God's spirit and what God is like wherever you go and in whichever way. Why is this good news? I think because of the reality of it. Who doesn't, as we thought about, I think, in the first message in this book, who doesn't need that sense of uh, knowing that they belong somewhere to something, whether it's to a greater cause or to a greater family or to a greater community? We all need that. And the promise of God working and giving his spirit to people is saying, he will confirm that you, you belong to God now and forever. That regardless of the experience that you've had in this world, perhaps regardless of the experience you've had in family, because we all grew up in such varied families. This is wonderful news for people who grew up, grew up in not great families. There's this promise that you can belong to the family of God and, and God the Father is, is nothing like. Um, he's even better than the best earthly parents because of his constancy and security and his his ability to keep a promise for thousands and thousands of generations. The Spirit 
does amazing things in the lives of God's people by working through them, but it also goes out and continues to call new people into this relationship that's made possible by the work of Jesus, and then give them the full and unmitigated privileges of being a son and daughter of God and confirm that so that they need never wonder to whom they belong. May God bless his word to us. Amen.